Hi, I'm Penny Coleman, and I'm delighted to be with you all today um, virtually, which isn't what we had all expected, and I hope you're all doing well. So let's take off on the trail of women's suffrage landmarks. And this is a journey that I've been doing for over 30 years. Um, just taking long road trips and going here and there. If I had a speaking engagement someplace, I'd do some research to see if there was a landmark to a historic woman. Sometimes I would discover them serendipitously, but I've gone through uh, my landmarks and selected ones relevant to suffrage, which was actually part of the research that I did in writing my recent book, The Vote, Women's Fierce Fight, which is a chronological multi-pronged narrative where I deal with a variety of issues, um, personalities, tactics, uh, the impact of racism and white supremacy on the vote issues that we're still dealing with today. Uh, and we're going to start in historic St. Mary's City in Maryland. And I've gone there actually twice to see this uh, landmark to Margaret Brent. Uh, it's a wonderful gazebo. It's at the southern tip of Maryland. And that's uh, the uh, wonderful, just a wonderful view. And I've been there in 2009, and then I returned again in 2011. And as you can see, uh, the words on the screen that Margaret Brent made the first known request in the New World by a woman for the right to vote. And actually, uh, inside the gazebo on that pedestal where there you can see the uh, plaques uh, on the side that describe her request. And on the top is this bas relief. And that's Margaret Brandt with her skirt a swirl coming into a legislative assembly meeting. And she actually demanded two votes. One for herself, she was an independent unmarried woman and managed uh, her business affairs. And the other, the other for um, uh, Leonard Calvert, the deceased, recently deceased governor of the colony who on his deathbed had made her the executrix of his estate. Uh, Margaret Brent, of course, was turned down, but her bold um, deed was remembered. Uh, records were kept. They're still there in the archives of the Maryland Historical Society. And one of the astonishing but particularly interesting things to me, because one of the things that I noticed uh, about suffragists is that they were historically reverent. They, they knew their history and they remembered these pioneers, even Margaret Brent from 1648. Um, for example, this is a recent landmark. I have to have it on my to visit, my to visit list that was, uh, is, is in St. Mary's City. And it is um, an, a landmark to a Margaret Brent pilgrimage that suffragists undertook uh, in um, 1915. Of course, many years after 1648, but they went in a prairie schooner that was drawn by two big white horses. In the schooner, there, they had army cots and a typewriter and a camera, pots and pans. Uh, they also had a gasoline, a gasoline lantern type thing that they would light so they could hold evening meetings and um, they toured uh, 23 days over 350 miles in the southern part of Maryland, spreading the word. And although they were uh, dealt with miserable weather, fierce storms, and also unreceptive um, citizens in some of the towns, they never wavered uh, in their belief that they were in fact um, recruiting women and receiving and encouraging the sympathy of men. From historic St. Mary City, we're going to go to Nantucket. Uh, and I had to make this trip to Nantucket to, uh, in homage to Lucretia Mott. Lucretia Mott, who is really, for me, one of the kind of keystone pe people in terms of any study of social reform, women's movement, abolitionists. And she's also a connector 
to um, many, many of the other key players, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony. Uh, and so uh, several years ago, and Nantucket is also the home of Mariah Mitchell, the legendary um, astronomer. So that was a very special landmark trip. Uh, Lucretia Mott ends up living in Philadelphia, our next stop with her husband, with her family. And uh, this sign was interesting because I discovered it serendipitously. I actually was speaking at the U.S. Mint and I was doing my program on celebrating women, which is a general program of not specific to suffrage, but general program to historic women. And when I was leaving, a woman who was escorting me out of the building said, by the way, did you see that sign? And she pointed to this one the marker for the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society. And as you can see, it honors Lucretia Mott as the, as the founder. Um, however, that's not totally accurate because this as, was in fact founded by 18 women, uh, black and white, uh, who founded it after they were refused admittance to the all-male anti-slavery um, society. And this, the picture is Harriet Fortin Purvis, and she's the daughter of Charlotte Vanden uh, Fortin, and a very prominent and important African-American family in Philadelphia. And the other, her sisters, Margareta and Sarah. And so uh, this, this is a, a particularly open, and I think we should, you know, get this, uh, landmark updated because it's a reminder and a marker of the close connection between the abolitionists, the anti-slavery movement, and the women's rights movement because the uh, Harriet Fortin Purvis and Margarete in particular become leaders in that first generation of women's rights activists um, who were the fought were among other things fighting for the for the right to vote. And as many of you know, that this connection between the abolitionists and women's rights activists gets severed after the Civil War uh, over the debates, fierce debates over the 14th and 15th Amendment. The 14th Amendment became um, kind of catastrophic in the eyes of, for example, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, because uh, in the second section of the 14th Amendment, the word male is introduced for the first time in the United States Constitution. Um, yeah, three times in that one section to define a citizen in terms of voting rights as male. So when the 15th Amendment comes along and it prevents, prohibits states and the government from denying a citizen the right to vote based on race, color, and previous condition of servitude, servitude, the fact that the 14th Amendment defined a citizen vis-a-vis -vis voting as a male meant that the 15th Amendment just enfranchised African-American men. And this led to um, huge um, and at times ugly uh, rhetoric and confrontations and split apart former friends and allies. And the result in 1869 is the formation of two suffrage, two women's suffrage groups. From Philadelphia, um, we're going to go to Waterloo. And it's interesting because one of the white women in Philadelphia, Marianne McClintock, three years after the Philadelphia the Female Anti-Slavery Society was formed, Marianne McClintock goes to Waterloo, which is where we are next. And on July 9th, she goes to this house. And this house is now part of the uh, Women's Rights National Historic Park. And this is the home belonging to Jane Hunt. And, and I realize that um, you're not necessarily going to be able to read all the details, but you can see in the, in the interpretive panel that this is now part of the Women's Rights National Historic Park. And you can see the uh, women who attended uh, this tea party uh, at Jane Hunt's house 
Um, and I'm sure they're familiar to many of you, Jane Hunt, Marianne McClintock, Lucretia Mott, who was visiting her sister, Martha Wright, who lived in nearby Auburn, and of course, Elizabeth Cady Stanton in nearby Seneca Falls. Uh, and at that tea party, Elizabeth and of course, Lucretia Mott had met eight years earlier. So they had this friendship and had experienced having women uh, delegates to an anti-slavery society being denied uh, a seat. But Elizabeth uh, poured out all her dissatisfaction and frustration and out of this tea party, these women decided to hold a convention to deal with the, um, the social, civil, the religious, the condition and situation of women. And as the bottom panel says, um, a movement was ignited. Uh, a few days later, Elizabeth returns, but now she goes to Marianne McClintock's house, which is also part of the Women's Rights National Historic Park, and that's the sign in front. And she meets in particular with Sarah, one of uh, Marianne's daughters, to draft a document that we now know of as the Declaration of Sentiments. And they uh, took that iconic, the iconic words from the Declaration of Independence um, that just talks about men being created equal, but they said, and women, uh, two words with a profound, uh, prof make a profoundly different uh, kind of statement. Uh, a few months ago, I happened to go to an exhibit in New York City and was absolutely thrilled to see this um, excerpt. You can see I've just put it up on the screen of a letter that Elizabeth, uh, it's dated March 31st, um, 1897, that Elizabeth is writing to Sarah, one of um, um, Marianne's daughters. And she's writing and asking, uh, she talks about wanting to buy, to sell. Would you sell um, the table on which the declaration is written? And she identifies, you can see that up in the fifth line, that Lizzie and I, which would be Elizabeth, another one of Marianne's daughters, wrote together. Lizzie and I wrote together. And would you sell the table? And so it's a, such an interesting um, example of, um, Elizabeth's um, awareness, acute awareness of what they had done as being not only historically significant, but wanting to very much preserve uh, the, the artifacts from these events. And then on the 19th and 20th of July, 1848, in Seneca Falls, on the left, you can see the landmark to the first convention was held on this corner. And the next picture is sort of one of my favorites. I was at Seneca Falls, I'd been speaking and I was sitting on, on the side and spotted this family. And what they're doing is walking along the water wall. You can actually see um, water on the bottom if you look at the uh, at the bottom of this, uh, the wall. And it is inscribed with the Declaration of Sentiments, which is probably, it seems like the father is pointing out something and talking head to head with his son. And uh, the uh, mother and daughter are probably about at the point they're reading the uh, signatures, the people who signed the Declaration of Sentiments. From there, I want to focus on what I've titled, titled conventions, organizations, rallies, and meetings galore. And in culling through my um, collection, I discovered I had landmarks and others I found on, on the internet. And although um, the conventions and organizations and rallies and meetings, I don't think have ever really gotten study. There's certainly not been like a biography of or a, you know, a study of these. I, I for one, um, follow them in my book. Uh, in particular, I also did the same thing in my book, um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, A Friendship That Changed the World, because I feel that these uh, gatherings, these conventions, which were always very elaborate, very carefully organized, um, very um, professionally run, there was a very clear sense, detailed um, reports on a variety of issues from uh, delegates. I mean, it's very, very interesting to contract, contrast um, the, 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 
focus on um, having these be really um, substantial and significant events um, with, with very important speakers. And if somebody couldn't come, they would send a letter and the letter would be read. I mean, it's a really kind of an interesting world to look into that. And to me, these conventions are, and the, all these, the organizations, the rallies, all of these are, are a through line. They, they continue from the start all the way to the end, and they're like the backbone. They're like the arteries and the veins of this movement. Um, two weeks later, there's one in Rochester. Uh, this convention, and it says that on the plaque, is the first one presided over by uh, a woman. Then there's uh, Salem in 1850. And this sign actually, that picture was taken a number of years ago. I think I was on my way to speak in Cleveland and made a detour to go to Salem. This sign has actually been replaced by very significant, uh, large, um, very handsome signs that are placed at all the four roads that come into Salem. So Salem has really embraced their location as the first women's rights convention. And I actually wrote uh, several paragraphs about this convention because it, it's to me illustrative of the fact that suffragists were politically savvy long before they're usually given credit for being, po uh, for being politically savvy. And why I say that is because uh, women knew that uh, the men were gathering to have a constitutional convention. And so they organized their convention several months ahead of time for the purpose of meeting, discussing, passing resolutions, and, and sending them to the all-male constitutional convention, putting them on notice that, that the women were, were active and they were watching. They, they weren't successful, but the point, my point, my larger point is, is they were politically savvy about interrupting the male dominance, the male scheme for controlling and making these decisions. Uh, in 1851, there's a, the Indiana's first women's rights convention. And all of these markers actually were, have been um, uh, uh, installed, erected within, you know, the, not, these aren't recent. These are markers that people in these areas uh, decided they wanted to have before um, all the energy and excitement about the, um, about the centennial year. Uh, and this in Indiana is it, actually the response to a manifesto from a woman named Amanda uh, way who in January issued a statement basically saying, you know, the condition of women is terrible and we have to meet and form a committee and get it done. And so they did. And it's an interesting thing again. And again, you can see at the bottom of the marker, women and men who favor abolition, temperance, and suffrage attended. Again, it's this coalition, this coming together of these various uh, social movements at the time. This is the Women's Rights Convention, the first one in Pennsylvania. And this was interesting because a 24-year-old man named Evan Pugh speaks and talks about how man, men as in men will never be uh, elevated as long as women are degraded. And this uh, convention is also one that Lucretia and James Mott came to. And this, is, this again is one of the interesting things is how so activists around the country were aware of these conventions and they would either go, they would speak, or they'd send a letter. So there was very, a lot of awareness and a lot of connection around these conventions. Um, this is interesting, and I actually hadn't really been aware of this one until I started to put this program together, of a rally, a women's suffrage rally in my book. And you'll notice the date. It talks about May Day rally on the second line uh, in 1918. And I write about the May Day rallies, a women's suffrage, a national women's suffrage day. Um, that was high drama all over the country with parades and meetings and gatherings. Uh, there are also reports of husbands who threatened their wives. One report of a husband who beat his wife to prevent her from going. And all of this is a very charged, charged time. But it was interesting for me to, to see this marker because it 
it talks because as you know uh, this is in Nashville and Tennessee ends up becoming the um, the belly of the beast in terms of the fight to to finally get the 36th state to ratify the 19th amendment and so my my sense is the fact that th from 1914 till 1920 and it talks about um, women marching from the capital to centennial park where, and thousands would gather and the names of those women and dallas studley maria thompson durs sue shelton white uh, uh, catherine kenny abby crawford milton those those women are women who become key players in 1920 so it's this interesting uh, thing to think about the energy and the strength that was was being reinforced and the connections the connections that were being made um, uh, this is actually a new marker as you see in the bottom where it says the William C. Pomeroy Foundation 2019. This is a foundation that has taken on an initiative to finance of the erection of uh, suffrage. People have to apply and you know make their case for the suffrage. And this one was dedicated uh, in Baltimore to uh, Augustus um, Chisel and Margaret Hawkins, who, and of course, this is, this is reflecting the fact that by this time with white supremacy and racism, you know, widespread and openly, um, you know, part of the national scene, of, of, of many of the white organizations were segregated, uh, but undeterred African American women who were very involved in the club movement um, are meeting and are very active and are educating each other. Augusta Chisel uh, writes a primer after ratification and devotes herself to voter registration and to education. And she talks about the fact that it's not enough to have the vote you have to use it. I also wanted to do a section on a, what I call a panoply of women, because although, of course, it it's, goes without saying that the number of landmarks to women is minuscule compared to the number of landmarks of men, but nevertheless, there are some wonderful landmarks. There are street signs, there are buildings. Uh, Francis Perkins, the Labor uh, Department of Labor is named after the Francis Perkins. So there, uh, and as I said, there are street signs, um, uh, uh, historic markers, plaques, memorials, uh, statues, sculptures, busts, all kinds of ways that you can find uh, historic women honored. Um, I'm just going to go through a few and I've done them geographically. We're going to go from Ohio to Wisconsin. Now we're in Indiana. Um, the Betsy Mix Coles is the woman who was presided over the Salem Convention and she's the one to told, told the men that they were to sit in silence and they did not mess with her. They obeyed for all the days of the convention. Uh, this, of course, is Amanda Way uh, in Indiana, and it's not uncommon to see, well, it is a little com uncommon to see a two-sided marker, but uh, this is one to uh, Amanda Way that uh, talks about her being a founding member of the Indiana Women's Rights Association in 1851. Uh, you can also look at a marker. I read this one, and you can look and you say, oh, participant in the whiskey riot here. What's the whiskey riot? So landmarks can be fun. Um, they're not always accurate. Landmarks have lots of misinformation, wrong information, misspelled words, but even that's provocative to kind of look for them and, and find them. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony called Amanda Way the mother of women's suffrage in Indiana. Uh, let's move on to Fayetteville, New York, and Seneca Falls. Uh, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, of course, who was the co-editor with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, to your right, that's Amelia Earhart. Um, that's a great statue, um, a memorial in Seneca Falls of uh, Amelia Bloomer introducing Susan B. Anthony to Elizabeth Cady Stanton after a meeting. Uh, the, Marker uh, to Veracue, where I'm kneeling down, uh, that uh, actually I was, I've sort of forgotten the year, it was a number of years ago. I know I was on my way to um, a conference in Minnesota and I'm looking for my 
my thing, I wanted to read you the um, I wanted to read you the inscription on um, on um, Lucy Stone's marker. I think this marker in Veracu, which is on private property, is perhaps based on my knowledge the first and the oldest marker to a woman. And it's actually got um, at the bottom, it actually has a, a, a Alice Stone Blackwell, Lucy Stone's daughter, uh, 1930, uh, inscribed at the bottom. And as best I can find is Alice Stone Blackwell, who would have been in her 70s at the time. Um, and, and I'm sure part of what was going on was her, you, I'll read it to you and you can decide, but part of what was going on for her was was wanting to have her mother not left out of the 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 I, the um, triumvirate or the whatever the constellation of the leaders of women's rights and the women's suffrage movement. She dies in eighteen. Uh, Lucy Stone dies in eighteen ninety three. Um, Elizabeth lives to be uh, to 1902, and Susan B. Anthony, who's again a legend in her own time in 1906, has certainly become um, the 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 iconic figure in this. So here's here's what that says. It says here, July 4th, 1856, Lucy Starr, and then it has in parentheses, Morning Star of the Women's Rights Movement, delivered the first woman's rights address and anti-slavery speech ever given by a woman in the great Northwest. The platform broke down, rising unhurt she cried, so will this nation fall unless slavery is abolished. And then the last line on the plaque says, the world for women has been revolutionized largely through the efforts of Lucy Stone and her co-workers, and it's basically signed Alice Stone Blackwell, um, 1930. And although I, I didn't actually know about it at the time or go see it, um, I've subsequently discovered there's a replica of this marker because this is on private property, although you can see the sidewalks right there, so I just, I wasn't trespassing too much. Uh, there's a replica of that marker in the cemetery in Veracue, where you can see that. And you can certainly see this marker unless it's overgrown um, by standing on the sidewalk. But it's um, interesting. And for those of you who make pilgrimages or feel a significant connection, it's, it's sort of a neat spot to go to. Go to. Uh, out, this is one of my all-time favorite statues of uh, 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 Sojourner Truth in Florence, Massachusetts. And this is a particularly nice landmark because there's wonderful interpretive plaques, um, signs around this uh, base. It's, of course, right near Northampton. And I happened to be there soon after it was dedicated, which is why there are um, you know, so many flowers. And it's, it's a really a wonderful piece of work and a, a very interesting. There are a number of statues to Sojourner Truth and a bust in the Capitol. And then of course, a new one is going to be dedicated in Central Park of Sojourner Truth, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Um, this is a wonderful marker in uh, Ho um, Holly Springs, Mississippi to Ida B. Wells. And um, this is her hometown and there's a museum there and I, Particularly, I you know I sort of look at some of these landmarks artistically, and I really like the green. I, you know, you sort of have to think about the all kinds of things in terms of a landmark. That's that's just sort of fun. Not you know the layout, the lettering, the content that makes just sort of a fun conversation pieces. Um, Anna J. Cooper, Anna Julia Hayward Cooper. These actually are two markers to her. Um, that uh, again, Raleigh, North Carolina to Washington, D.C., really, and again, I write about her in my book. And if you have an American passport, after sometime today when you're finished, uh, get out your passport and flip through, and you'll see lots of quotes by the typical men. And when you get to the very end, you'll see the one woman and a quote, and it's Anna Julia Hayward Cooper. 
um, really worth reading. She's really important. Ends up getting a PhD from the Sorbonne when she's an um, elderly woman, a really important woman to know about. I also write a, a lot about these two, uh, Mary Church Terrell, and she. this actually is a marker in Washington, D.C. to her, uh, and I write about it in my um, um, uh, epic, um, at the end of my book, uh, the epilogue about her activism again when she's an elderly woman to desegregate, um, do desegregation activism in Washington, D.C. The statue to um, Anna Howard Shaw, and I see I left the G off big, it's Big Rapids, Michigan, uh, was sort of a fun story. Again, a number of years ago, I was speaking at Oakland University, which is at the far eastern border of Michigan, and I knew about this statue, but it was at the western end, and it was during a gas shortage, and I didn't have a, I had flown, so didn't have my own car, and there were no cars to rent, but the person who had invited me to speak very generously, and I say generously because she had, I think, a half a tank of gas, and it was a gas shortage, said I could take her car, and of course I promised I would fill it up. So I drove literally, literally an eight hour round trip um, across the state and back to pay my respects to Anna Howard Shaw, who was uh, first an ordained minister, then a medical doctor, and then, um, you know, a difficult personality, but a really um, a heralded orator, um, praised for her, her ability to deal with um, difficult crowds, a wonderful sense of humor. She's president of NASA, the National American Woman Suffrage Association for a number of years. That's the group that organized, came together when the two factions joined in 1890. And, um, and it's, it's a really, um, again, it was a special, and I have to say all the gas stations were out of gas, but the person still was glad I had gone and said that she'd figured out. So it's a special memory in terms of just the generosity of people who can understand uh, a speaker's passion to drive across the state and back to see a statue. Uh, whoops, this shouldn't be there, huh, uh, slipped out. Well, see, she's on the move, so I guess it's appropriate. Harriet, Cub Harriet Tubman is not about to be constrained by a PowerPoint. I love this statue. This is in New York City. Uh, again, you see somebody's made a pilgrimage. It's not uncommon. You see the flower in the front. It's not uncommon uh, for me to find a landmark and to see somebody's left something there. I, I particularly love the energy of this and it's full of symbolism. There's symbolism on her, on her outfit. There's symbolism along the bottom. Um, the, the, on the back of her, that, those are the roots that the symbolizing her pulling slavery out of by the roots. Uh, when the statue was dedicated, there was um, some of the, uh, I think it was the men at the dedication complained that she had been placed to head south, not north. And the, that was what was explained to him them that that was intentional because that was the essence of Howard Harriet Tubman's courage that she went back to the south to bring to free other free people from slavery and of course Harriet Tubman uh, was also a suffragist. Um, all these women participated in constant campaigns, local, state, federal ratification campaigns, campaigns, campaigns. They financed them, they worked ceaselessly, energetically, suffered more defeats than victories, came up with really creative ideas from, do, from just doing and doing really innovative novel things, especially for women going door to door, marching in the streets, um, taking auto trips, uh, auto tours, riding horses. Um, woman who rode a horse across Massachusetts. Uh, it's just uh, astonishing to just read the details of, of the campaigns at every level 
and every region of this country. In Santa Fe, there's a marker noting that to Nina Otero Warren, and on the marker it actually talks about her as a leader in New Mexico's suffrage movement. Uh, she's also a really important educator. She's a writer. Um, in Ripon, Wisconsin, Mount Laurel Township in New Jersey, you probably already know who you're going to see, but of course, Carrie Chapman Catt, who was born in Ripon, although she grew up in Iowa, and of course, Alice Paul. And again, um, the, um, the Carrie Chapman Catt uh, marker, if you read it, is very much exalting um, her uh, as a gifted organizer, political strategist, and public speaking. Um, it, it, she, it's a very, um, um, again, a lot of um, PR kind of promotion. Um, but it is in fact true. She was the president of the nation's most important, certainly the largest. Now, whether it was the most important was a big discussion in my house uh, when I was writing my book. My partner and I had any number of conversations about the effectiveness of the tactics between uh, Alice Paul and the National Women's Party and her uh, the picketing, going to, going to jail, making decisions to do hunger strikes, the force feeding, uh, continuing to do this even though the nation was at war, um, enduring being beaten up by mobs of uh, military men and tortured and beaten up by the police. I mean, the government's brutality, as Alice Paul at one point said, they tried to terrorize them and truly, that's what it is when you read about it. It's very hard to write about all of this. Uh, it was a very grim period of writing for me. Um, and so the question in terms, and of course, Carrie Chapman Catt was all about decorum, and she really, really believed that she could just kind of nurture President Wilson along and kind of convince him and get him to come on board and to shift from his state's rights position, which of course, Wilson's state rights position was rooted in his racism and white supremacy, because um, the, as long as the suffrage women were being enfranchised state by state, then the states could do whatever they wanted in terms of putting other restrictions. And it's what's telling about it is, if you look at a map of ratification, all those southern states in Delaware did not ratify the 19th Amendment, and some of them didn't even ratify it until the 1980s. So it's a it's a interesting thing to to think. I mean, Wilson does eventually um, come out and and go to Congress and and support the federal amendment, but it's a very again. And which party would you belong to? You know, who would you be drawn to? Who would be charismatic in your eyes? I mean, it's part of what's really fascinating about this movement. Um, this is another person I did not know really much about until, again, I started writing my book. It's also a two-sided marker, but this is the side about her as a suffrage leader. And Madeline Breckenridge actually, as a young woman, uh, suffered from tuberculosis in her leg, which again was something I didn't know, and ended up having it be amputated. And so she's got this rather severe disability. Uh, she's also sort of frail. She ends up marrying a man who's not at all a stable, supportive partner. Um, and, and she uses the energy that she has to, as, as the marker says, and this actually is, I'd say, pretty accurate, that the ratification of the 19th Amendment by Kentucky legislature was largely credited to her efforts. Um, at one point, there's a wonderful quote where she's giving a speech and she said, she says something to the effect of, you know, they, they say that women aren't really capable of governing and making decisions, but considering kind of the mess in the state right now, what's to say men are good at that too. So she's uh, again, someone I didn't know much about who I got to know. Uh, and as you can see, she dies the same year after the amendment passes. So like many of the women, um, and I write about two suffrage martyrs in my book, Inez Milholland and um, 
uh, of Wishes um, March Miller in Oklahoma. Um, but there were, I'm sure, many other women who just expended everything they had for the, the cause. Um, in Nashville, we see this, we find this statue to, again, the Tennessee Woman Suffrage Monument. And the woman to the far left, although if you read about a description of this statue, it says that she's in the front, although it looks, it doesn't really look like that from this angle. But that is Juno Frankie Pierce, uh, who again, I wrote about in my book. And you only can see the feet and the bottom and the hand of the woman to the far right in the back, Abby Crawford Milton, who was president of the Tennessee Women's Suffrage um, Association and then becomes the first president of the League of Women Voters when the, there's the turnover. And Abby Crawford Milton actually invites Juno Frankie Pierce to speak because women in Tennessee had won a partial suffrage the year before and white and black women had worked together to register women and to get women to vote. And they continued that working relationship when Abby Crawford Milton invited Juno Frankie Pierce to speak uh, to their convention, which was actually held in the Tennessee Capitol building. Um, the woman with the hat with the flowers around it uh, in the front is Carrie Chapman Catt. Next to her is Anne Dallas Dudley, another really interesting personality to read about, very wealthy woman. Uh, with two children who she takes with her to march in parades. Um, very, very, and she is a believer in using all the wiles and southern charm and chivalry that she can muster in order to convince men that it's really not going to threaten them that much, that they, they will still have the southern way of life. Um, even when women start voting. So it's sort of interesting in terms of her, her strategy um, and how that would play with some of the Northern women who would sort of be askance about, whoa, what, what is she doing? And then having to have them explain that she's sort of trying to not destabilize this Southern notion of itself, yet still convince people to support, to not be threatened by voting women. And in the middle, uh, that's Sue Shelton White, who actually leaves Carrie Chapman Katz's organization, much to Carrie Chapman Katz's consternation. Uh, Sue Shelton White is a fireball of energy and whip smart and just bold and daring. Um, uh, Carrie Chapman Katz really prizes her in leadership position, but she leaves and joins the National Women's Party and Alice Paul. The other thing that I wanted to look at is that throughout the uh, fight, although you know, starting more in the 1900s, the suffrage movement was marked by having spectacular events, just wonderful events from all kinds of parades. Um, this is a plaque in Boone, Iowa. And I actually had gone to Boone, Iowa many years ago because there's a memorial there to Kate Shelley. And Kate Shelley is a young girl who um, on a rainy, stormy thunder uh, night, um, she heard that the bridge, a uh, railroad bridge was out and she knew that a train was coming and that if the train wasn't stopped, it would crash and go down into the river below. So she crawled out in the stormy night and crawled along the tracks and held up a lantern to signal and stop the train. So I had been in Boone and I, I, I knew that I guess after, I don't think I knew at the time that it was the site that it laid claim to the first uh, suffrage march, but this is a marker that now is in Boone. You can see it was dedicated in October 25th, 2008. And um, I was there probably three or four years earlier than that. Um, and, you know, that's the other thing you'll find in some of these markers wanting to lay claim to various events. I, I think that there was a much smaller parade in New York City first. There also in 2008 was a parade in California. But this is a really interesting parade because this is in Iowa, which isn't the most accessible point. And Anna Howard Shaw is there. 
and with her are two British suffragettes. And here they are uh, marching uh, along in their uh, long garments uh, in this very small, this rural town. Um, and that's not a paved street they're on to, to my eye, but with their flags and Anna Howard Shaw gave a speech. Um, it's uh, it's a, a wonderful thing to think about, an image. And, and again, one of the things that strikes me about these spectacular events is how well organized they are. They're like orderly, they're organized, they're typically costumed, they have their banners and their flags. Very different than, for example, what we see now, certainly the Women's March that I went to in 2016, which was, you know, just sort of cacophonous, is very different from the suffragist sense of how, how to put on a spectacular event. Um, there also were these hikes. That's Rosalie Jones in the bottom photograph uh, leading the pilgrims. Another really interesting character, Rosalie Jones. She led her first march, and, and again, she seemed to be drawn to winter marches. And you see they're dressed like pilgrims with their cloaks uh, in uh, 1912. And a few months before that, there had been a big suffrage march in uh, from Edinburgh, Scotland to London. And uh, there was a lot of cross pollination. And um, it, it, I think it's fair to say that Rosalie perhaps got the idea because there's a lot of publicity. Actually, um, last year in July and August, uh, my partner and I actually took a, an extended trip through England and Scotland and visited in the footsteps of the suffragettes and visited many, many um, landmarks that actually you can find, because uh, I blogged about that. But um, that's Rosalie. So then she leads this march. And you can see it's mentioned here. Uh, this is a sign. And what they're, what this sign is about is a group of women called the Army of the Hudson. They begin marching from New York City to the capital. And they meet supporters here in this town, Overly, Maryland on February 23rd. And um, they have a parade and they, they meet and I get the keys to the city. So that's one. And then that same day, I think we were on our way uh, to Washington. That same day, we found this marker in Hyattsville, Maryland to a suffrage motorcade. And the picture shows, uh, again, th this is the, the same year. Uh, 1913. Rosalie Jones in the earlier one was on her way to the huge suffrage march and pageant in Washington on March 3rd, 1913. And then in July of that same year, um, this is whole motorcade. For the last two years, suffragists have been gathering petitions with many signatures um, from all over the country. And then they gathered and there are about 60 automobiles there in Hyattsville, which is just outside of Washington, D.C. Alice Paul is there and she speaks. And then this whole line of automobiles, they line up and they drive in and they drive into the Capitol and they get out and they present the petitions to the various representatives. So again, this whole um, pageantry and organization and this sense of showing, you can see there's some women in white off to the right, there are a couple of men. Uh, in the back is a baseball stadium, which was sort of rare at the time. All of this is now covered over. There's some talk of archeologists maybe seeing if they can see if part of the baseball stadium is there. So um, it's not a site to visit. If we go to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania and Islip, New York, uh, what we'll see in Valley Forge is the Justice Bell, which again, I wrote uh, a lot about. And, what, and the justice bell was uh, done by a suffragist named Rauschenberger, and it's an exact replica of the iconic Liberty Bell, for, except two changes. One, there's no crack, and two, they've installed the word, they've inscribed the word justice. And I kind of had not really thought about the significance of justice not being on the original Liberty Bell. Um, and the fact that the suffragists inscribed it on their Liberty Bell. This was used uh, 
both of these, the lady with the torch, and if you've read my book, you can recognize that's Louisine Havemeyer uh, on the front, the bow of a tugboat. She's on her way to meet a tugboat from New Jersey. She's leaving from New York. They meet in the middle of the Hudson River, and she hands the torch to um, the new representative of the New Jersey, uh, Mina Van Winkle, who then will use this torch to tour around New Jersey because there are four big campaigns in 1915, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts. And the, again, to read about these campaigns is just a stunning experience in terms of the organization, the energy, the finance, the creativity, the art, artistry is, is really uh, stunning and heartbreaking and frustrating and infuriating to realize that all four of them went down to defeat all four of them. And in Pennsylvania, which was a state I spent part of my childhood in, and I, of course, always grew up with Pennsylvania and, you know, William Penn and religious freedom. And it wasn't until I really started learning the suffrage story that I realized that Pennsylvania was one of the states in which women never even got a shred of a right to vote, not even a shred. Uh, where they did get, like in Massachusetts, a shred, not much. But I thought, wow, that's, that's a really interesting, different way to think of a state history. It sort of depends on the perspective. So here are some of the faces of some of the women, just a few of some of the women that you've met. And, um, and in writing uh, my book, I actually came up with a list and also talking about it, I came up with a list of 10 characteristics. And I thought of in, them in terms of, I didn't kind of consciously realize it at first, but I realized I was thinking about them in terms of adverbs and adjectives. And so here's my list of characteristics that I have come to having been immersed in uh, years of, research and writing and thinking and getting, getting to know this extraordinary story. And one I had mentioned, they were historically reverent, internationally connected, politically savvy, impressively and divergently strategic, unabashedly attention getting. And it's important that their intention getting was not for them. It wasn't for the sake of them getting attention personally. It was always for the cause, always was always about the cause. This was not about, you know, ego-driven people clashing so that they could be the star or that they could get that. It was always um, in the service of the cause. Unequivocally artistic with their banners and their designs, everything just crafted and thought through, their posters, their maps, all the um, ephemera that they created, widely diverse, um, immigrants, working people. Um, one of the things that, that gets overlooked is how many immigrants pay, played really important roles uh, in this fight, starting with one of my favorite, um, uh, Ernestine Rose, um, Polish, uh, came from Poland and was really one of the first um, um, before the Seneca Falls Convention, who was canvassing the state of New York with petitions um, for women's voting rights. Um, so many, many, many Im immigrants, uh, working class women become very important, college women. Um, one of the things I discovered this really surprised me. One day I kind of thought, wait a minute, there are a lot of widows. There are really a lot of widows <laughs> dating back to the pioneer days, which was a really interesting revolution and revelation, even to the point I remember one woman, I think it came to me when I read about a woman who was an activist in, um, in um, Buffalo, New York. And then after her husband died, she up, sold her home and moved to New York to become a key, a key player um, with, Elizabeth, with a Katie Chapman cat. So that was sort of an interesting thing. Make, make with that what you will. But, um, and of course, the range of age from youngs and also boys and men were involved. Endearingly 
persistent, awesomely brave, undeniably pioneering, and undeniably pioneering. There's so many things that I could list under that. Um, for starters, just their demand that they be treated as political prisoners, not criminals. Also, even though picketing had gone on before, nobody had dared to picket the White House. Um, and, and just the level of the organizations, the level of the drama, the, the way they set up an apparatus for publicity, all, all of this that they did, um, all the attention getting strategies and devices, all the media driven things were, were really um, pioneering. Um, the fact that they sued uh, for being illegally um, arrested and the Supreme Court ruled that they had been illegally arrested uh, and throughout their conviction set the precedent that allowed, um, and I, again, I write about this in my book, that allowed um, subsequent groups to pick it, to have the right of picketing. So undeniably um, pioneering. And then in conclusion, I thought I would just let you know that there are many more photographs and information uh, on my blog and my Instagram accounts. Um, there's actually an Instagram account just for visiting landmarks and you can get all of them through my website. So I've learned a lot putting this together. Um, it's been fun, it's been interesting. Um, feel free to contact me through my website if you have questions or if you know of a landmark because I'd love to keep learning and adding to my list. Um, thank you very much.